Father, give us your clarity and vision tonight and help us see it in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, Jeremiah 33, verse 3, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I want to show you tonight how to have victory and power in prayer. How to have a truly glorious life of prayer. Because it's time, it's time you take your body and put that body under subjection. Amen. Call unto me, I will answer thee. Now God has made a very clear promise here. And show the great and mighty things, which means prayer always brings vision. Show the great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Now, the Bible says also in Psalm 34, 17, the righteous cry, and the Lord heareth them and delivereth them out of all their troubles. Psalm 34, 17, the righteous cry. Say the righteous. The righteous. Now, that doesn't mean that God Almighty, please hear this. I know maybe I may get in trouble here, but I don't really care. It doesn't mean that God hears every prayer. He hears the prayer of the righteous. He doesn't hear the prayer of the wicked until they get saved or repent. Jerry Falwell got in serious trouble years ago when he said God doesn't hear the prayer of the, of the, of the sinner. Well, he's right. It's in the, in the Bible. He hears the prayer of the righteous. And when the sinner repents, God will hear that prayer. That God does not answer the prayer of the sinner. If you're living in sin, God will not hear you. Even David said, come on, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord what? Will not hear me. Well, you got a bunch of people out there that regard iniquity and like it. So, the righteous are heard. Say the, say the righteous. righteous. Say, God, God hears my prayer. Hears my not the prayers of the wicked. That's what the Bible says, so we stick with the Bible. No, no worry what the world thinks about this. Who cares what they think? The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. Now, the Bible says that the wicked don't really pray at all. In fact, I want to show to you in Job 21. Come on, let's go to Job 21. Anybody that thinks that the wicked pray, you're mistaken because the Bible says they don't. No wicked person will ever pray. Oh, they may look at some idol. They may do some dumb, dumb thing. They may repeat something, thinking whatever. You know, people do all kinds of crazy things that are completely demonic. Repeat a sentence till demons show up, whatever. Job 21 verse 7 makes it very clear. On the screen, please, if you, if you don't mind. I want to read uh, Job 21 7, and then we're going to read from verse 14 right through 21. Wherefore do the wicked live? Become old, yeah, and mighty. But look what it says in verse 14. So it's talking about the wicked. Therefore they say unto God, depart from us. We desire not the knowledge of your ways. The wicked don't want anything to do with God. The wicked we just read in verse 7. Here's what they're saying in verse 14 and 15. They say, what is the Almighty that we should serve him? What profit should we have if we pray to him? Who are saying these words? The wicked. So the, the wicked don't pray. They don't want to pray. They have no desire to pray. Now, I'm going to get, get back to that portion in just a second. But why do they not pray? Why do the wicked not pray? Look at Job 15 verse 4. We're going to go back. We will go back. To Genesis 21, 14 through 21, later in just a few moments. But I want to show you and prove to you that those who are wicked don't pray. They may utter words, but they don't pray. The big difference between uttering words and praying. A lot of folks who are into churches light candles and, oh, God, help me. It's, 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 it's not a prayer. It's just words. Hello, are you listening? Yes. Let me light a candle for somebody who's dead. Is that prayer? No, they call it prayer, but it's not prayer. It's idolatry. It's the worship of the dead. Come on. That's all it is. So, Job 15 verse 4, on the screen please, on the screen please. Job 15 verse 4, yea, thou castest, God is talking to the wicked. Yea, thou castest off fear and restrains prayer before God. So why 
do these wicked people not pray? Because they don't fear God. It says so. You cast off fear. You don't want to fear God. So why pray? Then in Job 27, 10, they don't pray because they have no delight in the Lord. They have no delight in the Lord. And that's Job 27, 10. Anyone who doesn't pray doesn't fear God. Anyone who doesn't pray does not delight in God. So Job 27, 10, and he delights himself in the Almighty. Will he delight, excuse me, will he delight himself in the Almighty? Will he call upon God? I'm going to read that in the, in the King James Version. I don't know what translation you guys are, are putting up back here. But I really want to show you something because I really think it's the King James sometimes puts a little extra clarity on it. And please use the King James, if you don't mind, on the screen when you do it. Now, here's what it, what it says in Job 27 and verse 10. Because I want you to see this. I'm, I'm going to go back to verse 8. What is the hope of the hypocrite, though he hath gained... When God takes away his soul, will, 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 will God hear his cry when, when trouble comes on him? Will he delight himself in the Almighty? Will he call on God? Of course not, he won't. Because the scripture says very clearly they don't fear him. Nor do they delight in him, because that's a question. Will he really delight in God? Though the wicked don't delight in God at all. So they, pr they, they, they don't pray because there's no fear. They don't pray because there's no no delight and there's no knowledge of the almighty psalm 14 verse 4 psalm 14 verse 4 makes it very clear that the reason the wicked do not pray and i'm you know i'm glad i'm bringing those scriptures to you because some of you have family members who are religious but they're not saved they may attack you but they're the ones who are in 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 bondage um, look at Psalm 14, verse 4. It says this, Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and call not upon the Lord? They're not calling upon God. Why? No knowledge of God. When there's no knowledge of God, no prayer. And they don't pray in Zephaniah 1.6, you can put it on the screen for the people too. Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 6 says, They don't pray because they have turned away from the Lord. And them that are turned back from the Lord, and those that have not sought the Lord, nor inquired for Him. So anyone who is not seeking because they have not sought the Lord, nor have they inquired for Him. Why? Because they have turned back. Anyone who's turned back is not going to call on God. Now, let me show you. Let's go back to Job 21, Job 21, verse 14 through 21. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you what happens when people do not pray. And this is a warning to all of you that when you see this portion, take notice that, that things will, will start going wrong. So Job 21, I want to begin reading at verse 14, and I want you to pay attention to what the Bible says. Therefore they say unto God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. The wicked says, What is the Almighty that we should serve him? What profit we have, do we have if we pray to him? Now look at the results of no prayer in somebody's life, the wicked or whoever else decides not to pray. Verse 16, Lo, their good is not in their hand, the counsel of the wicked is far from me. Now, this is a powerful verse. It says, when someone doesn't pray, he'll never receive counsel from God. Meaning, they have no direction. God does not show them how to live life. They make mistakes all the time. They're always getting in trouble because of wrong decisions. When people do not pray, I'm going to say it. Some of you may not like this. They marry the wrong person. If you have married the wrong person, you may have to go back and wonder what happened. 
If you are in trouble with your relationship in marriage, go back and look at how it all started. Did you really seek God? You know, it's so sad. Uh, people, uh, when they buy a car, they test it way more than they test the girl they're going to marry. <laughs> they drive it more, they look at it more, they check everything, and they jump into a relationship like that. The Queen of England finally came uh, to a decision after she had her own children divorced that she told uh, her grandchildren that she will not allow them to marry until they court whoever they want to marry for five years. They said, only after five years I'll tell you yes or no. Because that's just because she learned her lesson. She saw what happened to all the, the, the other children. You rush into it. You never look and seek God. And what happens to you? Mm -hmm, you know. When you pray, God will show you what to do. God will show you even when you don't ask him to show you. Because you're a man of prayer. He'll give you a dream and warn you. He'll have someone come and say to you, the Lord gave me a word for you. Don't do that. Because you're a man or woman of prayer. So it says there's no counsel. That's number one. Number two. Look please at verse 17. How often is the candle of the wicked put out? Now that says to me, no light. Because it's talking about the people that don't pray. It's talking about verse 14 and 15. That one who says, why should I pray? I'm not going to pray. So now there's no counsel because of that. And number two, verse 17, there's no light. They're in darkness. They are in continual darkness. They can't see what they're doing, where they're going. Number three, it says, and how often comes their destruction. That means no protection. No counsel, no light, and no protection when there is people who are not praying. It goes on to say, verse 18, they are as stubble before the wind. You know what stubble means? It means no preservation. <laughs> the wind blows it off. They're not preserved. If you don't pray, there's no counsel. You don't pray, there's no light. You don't pray, no protection. And no prayer means no preservation. You will not be preserved. Something will go wrong in your life. Now it says in verse 19, let me just finish reading verse 18. They are as stubble before the, before the wind, as chaff that the storm carries away. It means no preservation. It blows them right off. Now, verse 19, for God layeth up his iniquity for his children. Well, now, this is scary. He rewards him, he shall know it. You know what that, that means? That means no forgiveness for his own family. That means judgment will come on his family for his own sins. That's frightening. There's no forgiveness for his children, meaning no forgiveness even to, for him too. God lays up his iniquity. It means God will not forget what the guy did for his children. Now, wait a minute. In Ezekiel and other parts of the Bible, God says he will not judge the children for the sins of the parents. But he does when they don't pray. I just woke you up. He does when they don't pray. Oh, brother. I'm going to say something. You won't like it. I think you can just decide for yourself. You can conclude for yourself what the Bible says. The wicked, the children of the wicked, bear the responsibility. Because it's generational. Are you people listening? It's generational. It's not broken. Only the blood breaks it. 
Are you people listening? Yes. They bear the responsibility. The judgment comes on these children as they grow older. Because there's no blood. There's no covenant. There's no protection on them. They are judged. I don't want my children to be judged. I don't want my grandchildren to be judged. So we better be people of prayer. Amen. Let me hear another amen. amen. Oh, the poor children. When those parents are not living for God, there will be judgment on the whole house. When salvation comes, it's promised to the whole house. And when judgment comes, it touches the whole house. Are you people listening? That's all Bible. Go check me, check me out. When God comes to visit, he brings salvation and blessings to the whole house. Even if the children are not saved, they will be saved eventually because the parents are under grace. The umbrella of grace is over the family now because of the parents. David, when you got saved and your wife got saved, it, that immediately you became the cover. The blessings of God came on your children, even who did not know the Lord at the time. Even when they were little and could not know the Lord by themselves. They came into the knowledge of God because you were blessed by his grace. Amen. Louder. Amen. When your grandma and grandpapa are saved, they bring that umbrella of grace over your life. And later, God will touch your life because of them. Because there is an umbrella of, of grace. God said to Noah, come thou and your house into the ark. The house, the family was included in the blessing. That's why Paul said, are your children not holy? Of course they are. Because you are saved. Even when you marry, please hear this, even when you marry an unbeliever, the umbrella is over you. And will include your unbelieving husband. Or unbelieving wife, unless they leave. But they come under the umbrella of grace because of your salvation, and your children are called holy. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody say, Thank you, Lord. Yeah, exactly. Because of you, you are the key to their blessings and protection. But the righteous pray, the righteous call on God. Anybody who doesn't pray, something is wrong with that relationship. And I think something is wrong with their salvation. Because how can you be born again and not pray? You will call upon, oh yeah, you're going to miss a day here, miss a day there. Stumble here, stumble there. But you will pray. Eventually you'll call upon the Lord. Something will happen where the Holy Spirit will convict you. But I'm trying to spare you that you don't have trouble while you do nothing about it. God wants to bless you continually. Amen. Say amen. Amen. Now, I'm going to show you something. Well, no, let me finish this. I'm going to then I'm going to show it to you because it's quite powerful. Now, let me just go on and finish this because it says in verse 20, his eyes shall see his destruction. Now, wow, not only is there no forgiveness, there's no mercy. His eyes shall see his destruction. He shall drink of the wrath of the Almighty. That's the guy that doesn't pray. There's no mercy. Because he sees destruction and wrath. And finally, verse 21, What pleasure hath he in his house after him when the number of his months are cut off? This tells me no blessings on his descendants. The children will not reap the blessings of the parents because they hadn't prayed and sought the Lord. So this kind of should wake people up to the importance of prayer. And the people said... Now, those who pray will experience something powerful. Go to Job 28, verse 7, 8, 9. Are you enjoying this? Yes. Are you enjoying it as much as I am? No. I enjoy it way more than you do. All right. Job 28, 7, and 8, 9. Look what it says. This is, this is one of the most powerful portions about prayer. It says there's a path. That no fowl knoweth. Now I'm going to put it on the... There we go. Look at me. <laughs> Say there's a path. There's a path. 
Now that path is that place of prayer. There's a path, look at me. Not the screen, me, moi. <laughs> There's a path no foul nose and no vulture's eye has seen. Meaning, meaning, the devils don't know where to find it. No foul knows it. No vulture's eye has seen it. It's called the hiding place. Listen here. When you find God, the devil cannot find you. That's when the devil cannot find me. You got it. Because God's presence is a hiding place. Hiding place means protection. So there's a, there's a place, there's a path, no foul knows. And these fowls are devils. No vulture's eye has seen it. No lion has passed by it. Lions are, again, here, symbolic of devils. And the fierce lion, or Satan, next verse. I've already gone on, and you guys are still there. The lion's whelps have not trodden it, or the fierce lion passed by it. Meaning, no devil, not even Satan himself, knows how to find the praying man. Or the praying woman. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Did you hear what I said? So say, when I find the presence of God, the devil cannot find me. You got it. Ah, yes. uh, you bet. Because that's what it says. It says there's a path, there's a place. No fowl knows it. No vulture's eyes has seen it. No lions have even come by it. Not even the fierce lion himself. Not even the devil knows where to find it. What is that place? It's the place of prayer. Because it goes on to say, the next verse, please, the next verse. He puts forth his hand on the rock. He overturns the mountains by the roots. Now, this is what God does. The minute you start praying, God will make a way where there is no way. That's what it says. He puts his hand on the rock. He overturns mountains. He starts to make a way for you. Look at the next verse. Oh, awesome. I love that. Verse 10, guys. Verse 10. He cuts out rivers among the rocks. His eye sees every precious thing. What this says is, when you pray, God makes a way where there has been no way. You know that old song, God will make a way when there's... Come on, Jim. Let's sing it for him. Let's sing it, please. God will make a way. Let me hear you, come on. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way, way for me. He, he will be, be my God. God. That's it, Sinash. Hold me closely to, to his side. With love and strength for each new day. We're going to sing it for somebody who is probably watching and then saying, I don't know what to do. So come on. God. Lift your voice so they can hear you. He will make a way for me. He will be my God. Hold me closely to his side. Sing it, Sinash. With love and strength for each new day, he will make a way. He will make a way. Dear God, I feel the anointing here, don't you? Somebody say hallelujah. See now, but we're going to believe God to restore those kidneys. No, no, stay seated, honey. Stay seated. God will make a way. My God.
God. Where there seemed to be no wind, His working in ways that you may not see. My God. He has made a way for you. For you, honey. He's always your guide. He's holding you close, closely in his arms. We love and strength for which new day he has made a way. On Saturday, I was in her home with her children. These are all her kids. Wave kids. And the mama came too. The mom is here. All of you guys came. And I went and had communion with them on Saturday in her home. And the power of God hit her and hit her mommy and some of those kids. And I said, you try and come Monday. So they drove a long way, caught Get, got caught in traffic, didn't show up till about 8. And uh, I'm just, I knew, everything in me knew, God is going to fix those kidneys. Yeah. And God's going to, she's crying here because she needs a miracle. So would you sit next to her and sing it again to her? I just felt that by the Spirit right now. Sometimes when God says do something, you obey, you know? Come on, lift your hands and pray for her while, while Sinar sings to her that faith song. God has made a way. My God. Where there seem to be no way. He works in ways that we cannot see. He has made a way for you. He will be your guide. He is holding you closely, closely in his arms. With love and strength for each new day, he will make a way. He has made a way. Hallelujah. Oh. Aren't you glad for the Holy Ghost, people? Lift your hands and thank Him. He's going to make a way for you. Whatever problem, whatever sickness, whatever matter is in your life, I promise you, God is going to make a way for you. Come back, Sinash, honey. Come back to your seat. I just, the Lord just said, do it now. It doesn't matter that I'm teaching. All that can wait. I felt the anointing when you began singing over her. Did, did you guys feel the same thing? Jeff will go probably a little longer tonight. So we'll just play it by ear, as they say. Hallelujah. The Word of God tells us in Job 28, verse 9. Just one more time, that verse, please. Verse 9. He puts forth his hand upon the rock. He overturns the mountains by the roots. Wow. Think about God doing that for every, every one of you sitting here tonight. And all you have to do is call upon the Lord. Those who pray will experience Proverbs 27, 12. In addition to this amazing miracle where a way is made for you to come out of that problem you're in when you pray, when you call upon the Lord Jesus. And, and I'm going to say something to you. You know, because we've heard it said, well, there's power in prayer. No, there is no power in prayer. The power is when we seek Jesus. Because all kinds of people pray. Religious people pray. Other religions pray. 
There's no power. Uh Uh-uh. But when you seek the Lord, there is power. Did you see the difference? How many understand what I said and you see the difference? Because we will say, well, there's power in prayer. No, no, there's no power in prayer. Because a lot of religions pray, a lot of heathens pray, a lot of unbelievers pray, whatever. It's seeking the Lord. That's what it means by power. When we say power in prayer, we mean when we seek the Lord. When we call upon the Lord. He said, call unto me. He didn't say just say a few words that don't mean nothing. We call upon the Lord. That's true prayer. That's real prayer. And that, of course, there's, there's power in that, but let me clear it up. Prayer, true prayer, is calling upon the Lord. The name Jesus. Then there is power. So Proverbs 27, 12 says that when you have a life of prayer, God will show you things to come And through that prayer, you can stop the evil and pray in the good. A prudent man foresees the evil and hides himself. Hides himself means he'll he'll pray. But the simple pass on and are punished. Meaning what? Meaning, now look, look, look at me, all of you. Every one of you will have dreams from heaven. Or you'll have a vision. That's very clear of something evil coming. When God shows it to you, he wants you to pray to stop it. So it says, when a prudent man, when a wise man sees evil, he will hide himself. He will pray. But the simple, the one who just doesn't care to pray, he'll just ignore it. He'll pass on. That's what it means. Pass on, he'll ignore it. But he's he's punished. Why? Why? Because God showed him the evil coming. He didn't do a thing about it. So the evil came. Whenever you have a dream or an impression or call it a feeling in your guts that something bad is coming, immediately pray that God will not let it come. Now when you see something good, you pray that it will come. So Daniel the prophet read the book of Jeremiah and saw that 70 years are now over. So he prayed that Israel would come out of Babylon. So I want to say this, never forget these words. Prophecy always is fulfilled in prayer. We have to pray to fulfill it. Prophecy is not fulfilled by itself. You pray it, and then it will be fulfilled. That's why Daniel prayed, then it was fulfilled. Now let me, let, me, let me give you another word here. And this happens a lot in our day because people are immature and foolish. They come to you with a prophecy. God is going to destroy you. Oh, <laughs> really? The word of prophecy is for edification, exhortation, and comfort. It's not for destruction. But when somebody comes with a word, well, God showed me you're going to die, you have to immediately break it. Break it with your mouth. You have to say, you have to say, you have to say, I break it in the name of Jesus. So the Bible says, no weapon formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that will arise against you in judgment, you must condemn. You condemn not by thinking it, you condemn it by saying it. If you don't condemn it, it will happen. Because there's life and death in those words. Did you people hear that? How many heard me put your hands up high that you understand you're going to do it now? So whenever someone says to you, I have a prophecy for you, and the prophecy is something bad or evil, you have to break it right there and then. Don't even wait till tomorrow. Pardon? You cannot be polite. Exactly right. You look at their face and let them have it. (laughs) Say, I break those words in the name of Jesus. I reject those words in Jesus' name. I break them and I destroy them now. 
Don't accept it. Now, if you, if you don't see them, you have to still say it. If they send you a word through a whatever, email or, or a letter, you break that thing right there and then. Are you learning this? Yes. All right, how many will do it? Put your hands up high. Because it's happening now all the time. There's a lot of crazy prophets out there. Self-appointed. Self-appointed. Everybody's a prophet and everybody's an apostle. Everybody's a bishop and whatever. <laughs> Sick. Did you hear what I said? They give themselves titles because it gives them importance. And the guy has 20 people in his church. 20 in his church and he's now an apostle. What made him an apostle? Come on, people, let's be real. They're not even recognized by the body of Christ. They're self-appointed. And they're, they're the ones who come with prophecies that aren't even from God. Don't you believe it? I know the Bible real good. Prophecies for edification, exhortation, and comfort. That's about it. And edification means it builds you up. Exhortation means it stirs you up. And comfort means it gives you a lot of peace. Amen. And the people said, Amen. Good. I'm proud of you. Now, let's keep going. So when you pray, God will show you what's coming to break it. Or if it's good, to fulfill it. Now, let's understand something about God. It's his nature to hide. Isaiah 45, 15 says, he hides. Why does he hide? So we would seek. God loves people to look for him. But why does he hide? He hides to destroy the flesh. Because when he hides, we seek. And when we seek, the flesh dies. The, the, the reason God hides is because he wants our flesh to die. Because the longer we seek him, the less of the flesh remains. So the Bible says in Job 23, 8, 9, 10, Job 23, 8, 9, 10, that God hides. So let's look at these scriptures. And then we're going to look at 2 Chronicles 32, 31. So in verse 8, 9, 10, it says, Behold, I go forward. He's not there. I go backward. I can't perceive him. This is what, you know, about God. You're not going to find God easily because he hides, okay? And he hides for a good reason. Next verse, next verse, next verse. On the left hand where he doth work, I cannot behold him. He hides himself on the right hand. I can't see him. Next verse, please. But he knoweth the way that I take. So he can see me. I, I cannot see him. He can, he, he can easily find me, but I cannot find him. Why? Because he's trying you. It says, when he hath tried me. So why does God hide? He hides to test you. He hides to try you. And then when you come forth as gold, he'll show up. So when God pulls away from you, it's not a bad sign. It's a good sign. When he pulls away from you, he's cleaning you up. Hello. So he pulls away from you that you might look for him. And when you look for him, the flesh starts to die. And when the flesh starts to die, the gold begins to show up. And when the gold begins to show up, God will show up. But he also does it for another reason. Second Chronicles 32, 31. Because most times we don't even know our own hearts. So God reveals us to us. How be it in the business, this is about King Hezekiah. How be it in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, who sent to him to inquire of the wonders that was done in the land. God left him to himself. God left him to try him that he might know all that was in his heart. So God pulled away from him to show him what was really in his heart. We cannot change. None, none of us can change till God reveals us to us. Till we cry, oh Lord, help me. Like, like Peter, depart from me, I'm a sinner. Like Isaiah, I'm a, a man of unclean lips, depart from me. God reveals you to you to bring change into your life. 
Because when, 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 when you see how sinful you are, you'll call upon the Lord. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of corruption? Paul saw himself and cried out that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, fellowship of his suffering. Now, you cannot find him half-heartedly. There's no, there's no results when you call upon God half-heartedly. Because if you call with half a heart, God will not answer you. That's why Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14 says, you seek him with all your heart, not half your heart. So Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14, please on the screen. Thank you, gentlemen, I'll wait for it. But you have to understand God is looking for a hot, stirred up, heated heart when you seek him. For I know the thoughts I think towards you, so says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not evil. To give you an expected end. But wait a second. A lot of people use that verse without reading the whole thing. You're not going to get this till you get what it says after that. Oh, they give people that promise all the time. God. Da, 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 da. But wait a second. See what else it says. Because this promise belongs to. Next verse. Then shall you call upon me. And ye shall go and pray unto me. And I'll hearken to you. So you can't have verse 11 without verse 12. And then verse, the next verse 13. And you'll seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart, not half-hearted. And then verse 14 says, I'll bring you out of your bondage. I'll be found of you. I'll turn away your captivity. I'll gather you from all the nations and so forth. And I'll bring you out of bondage from captivity. So you cannot find God with a half-heart. Only a full heart and the scripture says clearly the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous avails much that's James 5 16 through 18 so we have to pray when we pray we pray with persistent we want to see results and we must be consistent to prevail because we cannot faint now I'm going to show you something if I may please have an empty glass from somewhere Empty glass. I got to show you this because I think it really gets to you. Now, I'm going to tell you something I found in my experience, and I also find it in the life of saints I've read about. Tim, come here. You stand here with me. What, by the way, I'm so glad your mom and dad are here. Look how sweet they both look. Anyways. It, and you asked me why 21 days, right? In the car. Okay. I have found that it takes me 21 days to really find full power. So when I pray, I have to pray daily for 21 days be, before my cup runs over. So here is the way it works. When I pray, can you hold that mic for me? When I pray... The power of God begins to drip into my heart like that. Daily. It must be daily contact for this to happen. So just think that for three weeks, every day, God just puts a little more in my life. Now, now I'm going to show you something quick. And eventually... It, my cup will be full in about 21 days, right to the brim. Now, when, when it is to the brim, I'm flowing now. I'm not pumping. I don't have to try. I just whisper Jesus, and he's there. Wait now. Bring that uh, something, bucket, plant, anything, anything back there. Uh, I think this will do right here, Timmy. This looks like it doesn't have anything on the bottom. Oh, yes, it does. Oh, perfect. Now, if I miss one day, it took me three weeks to get this. If I miss one day, I lose it all in one day. Ah, you got it. The fullness is gone in a day. 
It took three weeks to get it and one day to lose it. So be careful. Neglect has a very high price. How many got that? Put your hands up high. It took me three weeks of prayer to get to the brim, to full power. It took me one day to lose everything I gained. Because one day of neglect will cost me three weeks of prayer. Now it's going to take me another three weeks to get back to what I was. And every time I stop, every time I stop, I lose what I accomplished. Can I say that again? So let's say you've prayed for one week, and then you miss a day. You just lost the week. And now you go back now, and you have to start all over again. Because you, you, you cannot regain what you gained in a week in a day. Think about how much you lost. Think about that. Just think about what I showed you. That's biblical fact. That's why the Bible says, don't faint. Don't give up. Jesus made it very clear in Luke 18, verse 1. He said, don't stop. Don't give up. Be persistent and be continual. That's why it says in Luke 11, daily prayer, daily bread, which is daily prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Daily contact is one of the most powerful things I can talk about when it comes to prayer. That's what I just said to you earlier. I want to show you how to be victorious and powerful. How? Daily contact. Daily contact is your incredible secret of power. So why do I pray daily? Because praying daily builds a substance in heaven on my behalf. So when I pray, God pours into my life. He pours way more than I'm asking for. Because now prayer, listen carefully please, prayer that becomes a succession of miracles in my life, it, 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 it begins to flow. That's what we mean by that. We're not pumping it. Now God starts to take care of needs in the future I don't have to pray for. Did you hear that? Yes. No, wait, wait, did you hear that? Yes. He will answer before I call. Because I already called and I'm full. That's what happened in Revelation 8. Because the Bible says God answered the prayer of the saints who were already in heaven. Meaning prayer outlives the life of the man who prays. Let's have a praise break. Come on, lift your hands and praise him for that. That's why, Jim, that's why, Jim... You are who you are because of your parents. I'm not done yet, guys, almost. Think about someone getting saved because grandmama prayed for them 50 years ago. So what, what was she doing? She was filling in the bank account, putting away things in an account that only God is watching over. It's like putting money for your, for your great grandkids and then you go to heaven and there's all that money left behind that they'll use. Prayer will do that and way more because when you pray, you build a, a uh, like a big substance, a big, call it a storehouse, a reservoir of, of, of miracles. So that's why they go and prayer is, 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 is answered. And here's the thing that is so awesome. Prayer is answered even in eternity wow. of things we've asked for down here. Hallelujah. So in the life of Daniel, if you look at the life of Daniel, he prayed three times a day. This is very key. Psalm 55 says, I will call in the morning, at noon, and at evening. Don't pray just once a day. Begin to do something smart. Get up in the morning, get a shower, eat breakfast, and talk to God for half an hour. Then when you are working at your lunch hour, talk to God again. Don't talk to those devils that work with you. Talk to God. I know. Hey, you know what? That's what it is like out there. You get home at night, eat your dinner, and talk to God again before you go sleep. It will build. <laughs> they are devils. Come on, please. It builds a reservoir of prayer. Comprende? See, say, see. 
good. All right. <laughs> the Bible says something powerful. Pray until God answers. I got so upset with a preacher back in the 70s who said if you pray more than once for something, the second time you pray, you pray in unbelief. I said, who told you that, buddy? Faith boys, you know. If you pray the second time, you pray the second time in unbelief. I don't know where they get that from. Elijah prayed how, how many days? Come on. Read it in Kings. The Bible says very clearly that he prayed. Elijah prayed seven times. Come on. For rain. How many times did, how many times did Moses pray? Forty days. For the same thing. How about Jesus in Gethsemane? Same thing. Till God answered prayer. There's no such thing as you pray once. For the, for the same thing. You pray for the same thing over and over and over and over and over till God will do it. Because he loves that kind of prayer. Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 18 through 20 says that Moses prayed for his brother. God wanted to kill Aaron. He prayed for him for 40 days. So God wouldn't kill him. They prayed for Peter to come out of prison. For days. It doesn't tell us how many but I can guess. They most likely prayed for him because he was put into prison before Easter to be slain after Easter. The church, I'm sure, prayed for at least three days, nonstop, day and night. Come on, you can spend that easy on your knees. The Word of God tells me, oh, this is marvelous, about the Syrophoenician woman who just won't stop asking. The friend who came to his friend at midnight who wouldn't stop asking. The lady who came to the wicked judge didn't, didn't stop asking because they, they understood. You keep asking till you receive it. And the Bible says something amazing. In, Matthew, uh, sorry, in, in Isaiah 20, 27, 5, it says, as you pray, God will give you strength to go on praying. So you, won't wear, you will not wear out. Because God knows how easily we all get tired. So look at Isaiah 27, 5. Well, Benny and I can't pray because I wear out so fast. Well, the Bible says God will give you strength if you, if you hold on. Let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me, and he will make peace with me. But it says take hold of my strength, not your own strength. So when you call upon the Lord, he'll give you strength. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. You got it. The Bible says our inner man is strengthened. Ephesians 3.16, he'll strengthen your inner man. That's how God does it. And now because you have sought him and will not stop seeking him, God will literally do something amazing with you. <laughs> Look at Isaiah 30 verse 18. This is awesome. Isaiah 30 18. I'm almost done. Almost done now. Yay! My goodness, Ellen just jumped. God bless Ellen. How can he be so calm? Say hallelujah. hallelujah. All right, look what it says. Therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious. So when you pray, God wants to be gracious to you, but he's waiting for you to call on him. Therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that do what? Wait. But he wants to be gracious. God wants to be merciful. God wants to bless your life, but he can't because you're not praying. But when you do, he'll do exactly what he's been wanting to do in your life. I love this. Psalm 42, 7 and 8. And then we're done almost. It says, when you seek the Lord, he will fill you with such power and glory Psalm 42, 7 and 8, please. He'll fill you with such power and glory. Deep calls unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts, because there you're calling by the Spirit. All thy waves, thy billows are going over me. Next verse is awesome. Well, the Lord, because of that call, will command his loving kindness in the daytime, in the night, his song. 
because you've been praying to the God of your life. God has filled you with such glory, you can't even sleep. You worship even while you're sleeping. Wait, wait, wait. You worship while you're sleeping. Your eyes are closed, you're sleeping, and you're worshiping. And your wife says, are you awake? And you're worshiping. Or your husband says, are you okay? And she's worshiping. She's worshiping because she's been all filled up that now the spirit of, of man is in action. Hello. I know what happens when someone reaches the brim, the fullness of prayer, because I've seen, I've seen it happen. In my own life, Suzanne's life, when she behaves. <laughs> You don't know how powerful sometimes Suzanne is. Very powerful. When I, when I married her, that girl prayed all the time. She didn't stop. I couldn't sleep because she prayed. <laughs> she get up at 4 in the morning and pray. I said, I said can't you just sleep so I can sleep? No, she said, my best time of prayer is 3 a.m. I said, why 3 a.m.? Why must you pray at 3? Like, can't you pray 3 in the afternoon? <laughs> Benny, 3 a.m. is when the devils are at work. I got to pray when they're at work. I never heard that from anyone before. That at 3, p at 3 a.m. is when the devils are running around, so you got to pray. So now I'm, 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 seriously, I'm on a plane, and she looks at me, she says, it's going to crash. I said, no, it won't. I was going to crash. She was with me. And I didn't like what she said. <laughs> but she knew it was going to crash, and it crashed. And when I pulled her body out of that plane, it was a Cessna one engine back in Florida, 1984. Uh, sorry, 83. April 83. Single engine Cessna. A place called Avon Park, Florida. Never forget that. And I pulled out. Suzanne out of that plane, she was knocked out, bleeding everywhere, and praying in tongues. She was praying loud. And I said, are you okay? Are you okay? She, she, she was praying and bleeding at the same time. Praying in the spirit the whole time. She prayed when the ambulance came, she was still praying. When they put her in the ambulance, she was still praying. She wouldn't respond to me. I said, Sue, Sue, I kept checking her. She, she was gone, gone, gone. She was completely knocked out. Praying in the spirit the whole time. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you she prayed for five hours in the spirit and didn't stop. She was praying when, we're, when, when they took us to the hospital. And later I said, how did you, like, you don't remember? She said, no. I said, you, I said, you prayed the whole time. While the ambulance is there, or they're, they're doing their thing, and you're praying. I said, they, they, were, they, were, they, they were putting stuff in her arm and sewing it back, and she's praying. I said, you were praying when they were sticking needles in you. I don't remember. I said, well, I, should. <laughs> I was there. <laughs> I'm telling you, people, there is a place of quiet rest. Even when there's trouble all around you, there's quiet rest in there. And you pray even when all the stuff is happening around you. Because it's built up. You've reached the brim and now it's flowing. Remember what I said earlier? You start to flow. Come on, lift your hands and say, Lord, I'm ready for that. Ready to flow where you pray when you're not even awake. You worship when you're not even, even awake. Because that's in the Word of God. When He said, I'll give you a song in the night. Oh, you're playing my one of my favorites, Jim. Near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest. Near to the heart of God. Wow, I love it.